So, so really, I'm I'm very glad that we can do this, and uh, it's going to be something somewhat unusual. It's not uh, clinical pa patient material, but it reminds us of clinical patient material. And there was a movie, and I'm very very uh, grateful that Angela Joyce can uh, can share with us her thoughts about the movie. And Angela Joyce is a fellow and training and supervising psychoanalyst and child psychoanalyst with the British Psychoanalytic Society. She trained as a child analyst at the Anna Freud Center and worked there for 20 years. And she was also a founding member of the pioneering parent-infant project where she was applying psychoanalysis to working with babies and their families. And she jointly led the child psychotherapy service. And she now works in full-time private practice in London. And she's also the chair of the curriculum committee of the British Psychoanalytic Society. And she's a member of its education committee, chair of the Winnicott Trust, a trustee of the Squiggle Foundation, and she has been an honorary senior lecturer at the University College in London. She published in the area of parent infant psychoanalysis, child psychotherapy, and Winnicottian studies. And then I'm also very happy that Nella Wagman, who directed this film, is actually here. And Nella, she is a, she's a theater and film director, and she's a writer. And we'll hear from her. I think the way we're going to do it, I'm going to re show. The movie, and then Angela Joyce is going to share with us what, how she thinks of this and what my what her thoughts about it. And then I think we'll have a discussion discussion between Angela and Nella, and then we'll we we'll talk. We can all talk among ourselves and see um, what we think about. It. Okay, um, well, welcome back, everybody. It's, and I think I'll, I'll give it uh, to you, Angela, and uh, see what you're eagerly okay. in your comments. So thank you. Hello, everyone, again. Um, so I'm going to read my, my comments. Uh, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me um, to this event, and particularly to have this opportunity to, uh, to reflect I think on this immensely poignant and sad film from a psychoanalytic perspective. There's so much condensed into this short piece and I hope I can do justice to it. There are many questions we might want to ask about what prompted this film to be made. How did the filmmaker capture such an intensity of feeling in this child in all her paradoxical blankness and sadness? It's such a bleak film too, which perhaps might make us reconsider the elements of a child's experience that lead to despair. It isn't always the stereotypical families on the, the caseloads of public clinics who have such damaged children. Much disturbance can lurk behind the doors of prosperous, affluent households. So my comments about the film will largely be about the content, which is of such interest, I think, to us as psychoanalysts. I'm not really qualified to say much about the film as a film, except to say that I think it is beautifully observed and also spare in its use of various elements that suggest meaning and thus enriches the narrative as it unfolds. For instance, as I've said, the setting of the beautiful house in beautiful countryside, nothing could spoil such a setting, could it? What came immediately to mind when I watched the film first, uh, not only from its title, Come Find Me, but also from the atmosphere and the story is Winnicott's quite well-known aphorism, it's a joy to be hidden, but a disaster not to be, to be found. This is the theme of the film. He wrote this in his paper, Communicating and Not Communicating, leading to a study of certain opposites where he's thinking about the paradoxical state of being available for contact with others and indeed its necessity, but at the same time, living in our interior world, also necessarily in the state of privacy in communicado, as he says. So the story of the film is of Sophia, a girl of eight years old, I think, 
who evinces such a strong sense of loneliness, even before the tragedy that befalls her family. The cinematography zooming in on her face, so we have such a clear sight of her listless, bored expression, initially eating sweets, which helps us get a sense of her interior life at this moment. She is listless, bored, aimless. The ordinary childhood experience of boredom here emphasizes quite another quality in her, which is what gives this sense of loneliness. As I've said, the setting at the beginning is of a very prosperous family in beautiful surroundings. One might think with all that wealth, what else could a child want? But even as the story begins to unfold, this affluent house seems to have no evidence that this is a home with children. There's no suggestion of the ordinary mess of a family house, what it usually contains, indicative of rich, creative presence of children and their lives. The house is smart, ordered, everything beautifully in its place. No toys left out to indicate a place for children. We do see a children's room, the younger child's, but it seems to me shut away from the main household. And indeed, the younger child, a toddler, is also alone in her cot, standing up, perhaps wanting company, but alone. Both these children seem to me to be lonely. And with that, I felt that we were entering the territory of not being found. Not to be found is a psychic disaster. And as the story unfolds, I felt that the tragedy was a sort of enactment of what was already an inner reality for Sophia. The difference between the capacity to be alone, where solitude is a resource, and a sense of loneliness is immense. Solitude can be a resting place for the self, to be in one's interior life in all its affective aliveness, to be in a state of joy hidden from the demands of the world, but not insulated or in retreat from it. Communicating with the self is contingent with communication with an other self. The experience and enjoyment of communicating and exploration of different forms of communicating and not communicating. The necessity for non-communication are central to Winnicott's understanding of what can be either the basis for normal, healthy living or its opposite which is an essentially false, compliant relationship with the external world. This produces an undeveloped internal relationship that may keep the person safe from relating with the world at the cost of really being alive. Here is to be lonely, in a place where one has not been found. It is the setting for the disaster Winnicott refers to. So bored, listless Sophia hears her mother talking on the phone, arranging a night out and a babysitter. And she runs with seeming hope and expectation that she might have some connection there. There's an apparently friendly, teasing greeting, tongues out at each other. And then mother wipes Sophia's face, grubby from the sweets. I thought to get rid of the mess, perhaps expressing the mother's wish to wipe away anything that threatens to spoil her seemingly ordered adult world. Sophia wants her attention, but her attempts to engage mother are only partially successful. Sophia's eyes, I think, are quite dull as she wonders what to do to find her mother. And then in a sudden lively way, she runs out of the room, calling to her mother to come find me, the central motif of the film. And here we are introduced to the younger sister, Charlie, delighted to see Sophia and intrigued by the game Sophia is playing. She, Sophia, gets into a large basket container, throwing out a soft toy that she finds in there and hides away, wanting and waiting to be found. So I find myself wondering if an aspect of this central come find me motif is thwarted hope and wish. For Sophia and Charlie both clearly want connection, play, 
but it falters and the connection fails. The symbolism of the container, I think, is interesting. A dark, womb-like space, perhaps even cosy, and where we might imagine Sophia has gone to unconsciously seeking some representation of her mother's insides, where she can find her and be found. But this space becomes a place where she gets lost. Sophia closes her eyes, seemingly at peace, as Charlie sings, You Are My Sunshine, a lyric that is echoed later in the film, painfully reminding the family of the toddler. This is supposed to be a game of hide and seek, and yet no one comes to look for, for Sophia. We don't see any playful, excited, where are you, or just coming. She's forgotten, it seems. And what we might expect of a mother who can hold her in mind, even with all the other demands of her time, it doesn't happen. This mother seemingly lets Sophia drop from her mind. Psychically disastrous for Sophia. No one comes looking for her and she drifts off to sleep as her sister is taken by mother for a drive. The drive is a disaster. Anticipated earlier when mother says to her friend on the phone, he shouldn't drive like a maniac. But as the bleak atmosphere of the film darkens even more, we are, as Sophia is, increasing left to infer what has happened. It seems increasingly that the message of the film is that words cannot be used to connect and the plot enigmatically unfolds almost silently, but powerfully conveying the unspeakable pain of loss. The babysitter tells Sophia when she wakes in the dusk, honey, your dad went to get your mum from the hospital. There was a car accident. Charlie's death cannot be named or spoken about. Sophia's face is still almost expressionless. There are no tears, no hugs, no more words that can connect or find and help Sophia give meaning to this terrible news. This is the only scene where indeed an adult attempts to give words to Sophia about this. Neither of her parents do this and no one gives any space to Sophia to cry, to grieve, to feel the loss of her little sister. No one finds her or helps her register and communicate this grief. We see some of the consequences for these parents who cannot do this for each other either. Mother asleep all day so that she's not there to greet Sophia on her return from school. And father gets furious with her, shouting and drinks his shot of whiskey. He singularly fails to see, we might also say find, his wife's state of mind in her grief, sleeping perhaps to shut off from the impossibility in this family of sharing feelings and supporting each other to grieve together. Mother silently screams as Sophia watches her from her doorway. In one scene, mother turns to Sophia, but describes her as a tough egg mistaking her almost blank face for no feeling and seemingly having no curiosity about her daughter's inner reality and realizing her own role as mother to help Sophia feel her internal state as seen and safely to give it expression. For mother to see beyond Sophia's blankness would risk facing the terrible loss they are all enduring. Sophia, Sophia hugs her mother to comfort her and later buys her sweets, feeling the pull to look after her rather than the other way around. Winnicott wrote about children who are needed by their mothers to care for them, to assuage the mother's unacknowledged depression as he saw it. He proposes that this pulls the child away from experiencing their own psychic reality and particularly their own incipient capacity for reparation and concern. Then, the inevitable guilt the child feels linked to the development, ordinary development of the capacity for concern. This inevitable guilt takes on a falseness, he says, as it is based not on their own facilitated experience, but an identification with mother. He says the dominating factor is, and I quote, the mother's organized defense against depression and unconscious guilt. 
As Winnicott acknowledges, the attainment of the capacity to make reparation in respect of personal guilt is one of the most important steps in the development of the healthy human being. But it is compromised in these kinds of circumstances where the child's task is to deal with the mother's mood, as he says. This mother's mood in a state of loss is so often one of preoccupation, bleak, dark, even a sense of deadness and blackness. Andre Green, the French analyst following Winnicott, also writes about the consequences for the child of the dead mother. Of course, he's not referring to the actually dead mother, but a mother who has become psychically dead, preoccupied with her own trauma, often a traumatic loss as we see in this film. The predicament of the child is to feel the mother's decathexis, her sudden loss of investment, as she retreats into her state of mourning, psychically absent, even if physically present, and her, not, her heart not in her mothering. What can the child do? Winnicott suggests identification with the organized defense, so that the child has to respond to the mother's deadness with liveliness and color, and we see the sweets later on in the film. Green suggests that the identification is with the deadness. I think they're in the same territory with slightly different emphases, but underline the impact on the child of the loss of the mother and father's facilitating presence. In the film, I had a sense of Sophia's loss of her mother consequent upon the death of the sister arrives into an already compromised situation. As I described the early part of the film, I don't get a sense of feeling a lively child in a child-friendly household with a secure sense of being at the center of the parent's world. Perhaps this is one of the developmental challenges of latency and Sophia then has to deal with the un unfolding of her own separateness and the loss of that position as Her Majesty the baby. Undoubtedly, she's already had to engage in this with the arrival of Charlie, the little sister who displaced her. Inevitably, then, she would have had to negotiate her new place in the world as the elder sister, tolerating her jealousy of the new arrival. But the sense of aimless listlessness in those early scenes didn't give me a feeling that this child and her family had the necessary robustness to deal with the tragedy of the loss that unfolds. And indeed, this family doesn't. There is such a tragic sense that they cannot mourn the loss of, this, of their little girl. There's no representation of the rituals that assist in mourning. No funeral, no shared time remembering Charlie, just a sense of atomized individuals alone in the loss. Father turns away with an exasperated sigh as his wife is hugged by Sophia making no attempt to join them and providing any holding himself. We see Sophia looking on her iPad alone again, conjuring up the memories of her sister through the photos that she has there. This is not a shared space. No mother, no father to remember with her. Mother is then shown alone, distraught, but alone. And then into this place of tragedy comes, another, comes an attempt at a solution. It's a magical solution, which in itself also portends another kind of tragedy, that of the replacement child. Mother brightly asks Sophia, who's been looking at the pictures of her dead baby sister, whether she would like to be a mommy one day. And through this, I think, strange conversation, she tells her that she's to have a new baby sister, as if the new baby will magically obliterate the terrible loss following Charlie's death. We get a fleeting sense of the mother's otherwise unacknowledged grief in her facial expression, but no words apart from another baby sister to allude to the loss of the first baby sister. Your baby, as mother strangely says of Charlie to Sophia. Sophia pensively glances at her mother's face as she touches her pregnant belly, but nothing is or can be said. It is unspeakable for this family they have no words to capture and share their loss. This, I think, is the tragedy. The film cuts to Sophia and her father shopping for a tea party 
And it's here that Sophia gets the sweets to sweeten, deal with mother's unspoken mood. The table is to be laid and the happy family arranged around it, all as if the expected baby is to arrive into a space well prepared for her. Well, look how nice this all looks, mother says, emphasizing that what is apparent is what is important, not what is hidden. Mother's mood, though, is discernible again in fleeting facial expressions. And in contrast to the overt pleasure in the tea party, there is a sense of the underlying but unreachable pain. The lost baby is unconsciously again alluded to, as Sophia describes her sandwich as a twin. I thought the two baby sisters, but maybe others have other thoughts. And then to complete the party, music is needed. Father goes to his playlist on the phone and You Are My Sunshine, My Only Sunshine comes on. This could be a chance to together share their grief and loss of the sunshine baby whose absence has brought this dark cloud over them all. But there's a sense of panic as Sophia runs off to get the box of sweets and mother threatens to cry. Father urgently apologizes and turns the music off. Mother can't really accept Sophia's attempts to sweeten her and she turns away and leaves the table. Sophia is left alone as father follows her mother. This awful sense of blankness suffuses the scene. Distress cannot be experienced. It's all alluded to and by implication not allowed or certainly restricted. So for Sophia, this is disaster. She's not found, rather left alone and saturated in barely acknowledged, dreadful feelings. The sweets won't help. What will? No one seems attentive to her predicament. No one interested enough in her emotional life, her experience to attend to her. What will its fate be as she grows? The last part of the film focuses on the impending arrival of the re replacement baby. And we see Sophia increasingly dulled, cut off from emotional connection. As Winnicott would put it, she becomes increasingly insulated, not in a healthy way, able to experience her inner reality with a sense of realness, but I would think in danger of becoming emotionally unreachable as she has not been reached. Then the scene in the car with the parents talking about their preparations for the new arrival and Sophia is staring blankly through the car windows, raindrops alluding to tears that should be shed but can't be. She progressively disappears behind the blank face and nobody looks to find her. There is no seeking of what is hidden. In her dead sister's bedroom, with the cot draped, emphasizing Charlie's absence and death, her parents speak over her and then leave her alone. She goes into the basket container, which we've seen at the beginning of the film, and finds there the forgotten soft toy, which she had chucked away earlier. The symbolism is replete with potential meaning. Her sister tossed away, herself forgotten. She closes the top of the basket and nobody seems to notice that she's disappeared. Is the basket now a casket, a coffin, in which her hidden, unfound feelings are placed in the tomb? like the tomb of the dead mother, which Andre Green proposes, is where the child has to take up residence, forever tied to the lost and dead mother. She remains unfound as the film draws to a, co a close. So we might want to think of the long-term consequences for a child like Sophia. She's suffering the absence of parents who can meet her needs for comfort, holding and containment, so that she could register not only her sister's death, but the psychic pain can be endured when it is responded to. The risk of an unhelpful and spurious self-sufficiently is high with the added estrangement from her inner experience of powerful feelings that cannot be marked and integrated. We know that traumatic loss, which has not been worked through in earlier development, doesn't go away. Not only has Sophia lost her little sister, a loss replete with complexity, but she's lost her father and mother insofar as she had them in the first place. She has lost any sense of their contingent emotional presence 
which for a young child <clears throat> remains a significant source of resilience and robustness. As our adult analysts, we often meet some version of this history in our consulting rooms. And in my view, it behoves us to be alert to its lasting presence. So they're my observations on the film. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for organizing our thoughts about this. And, uh, and I really, I also wanted to thank Nella for being able to put such difficult experiences in this, in a very sensitive way into a movie where we can think about it. And I think uh, what might be helpful for us now is, I think Angela, you had some thoughts about it uh, and wanted to ask Nella, and then maybe we can all talk together about it. So sure. I wanted to see Nella. Uh, so, hi, Nella. Hi there. <laughs> so we, shall we confess to the other people here that we've already had a, a conversation which was actually very nice to touch base with you and to begin our sharing of our thoughts about the, the film. Um, and I asked you then, didn't I, well, what prompted you to make such a painful film, which as I was reading my, my observations, I, I, I found myself being more and more um, dark and bleak and um, how, how did you get there? Well, as I, as I said to you, yes, indeed, we can chat about this previously. Um, my purpose really was to explore, as, as you so eloquently put it, um, you know, the repercussions of early childhood experience on adult life. And my, my purpose in the film really was to, to, to put a light on that because it does strike me, certainly as a filmmaker and as a theater maker, that most experiences that are brought into art are tend to be adult and that most people really don't consider the experiences of early childhood um, as formative as, as of course all of, all of the people gathered here today understand, but that I think in general, the world doesn't see it that way and doesn't appreciate how, uh, how truly fundamentally early experiences will lay out a trajectory for a life. Um, you know, and in someone as young as, as five or, and, you know, and, and younger, certainly. Yeah. And so this film has been largely seen, I think, by um, an audience who, from our point of view as analysts, we'd regard as a lay audience. So ord the ordinary person in the street or the person who goes to a film festival and watches it. And, and can you tell us a little bit about uh, how people have responded to it, um, whether they they've um, yeah how how they've uh, taken in such a a dark and sad sad narrative. Um, sure, it, it's an interesting question because um, as some of as some of you know here, I I have been a theater director for most of my adult life, but recently went to film school and got an MFA, and this was my thesis film. Um, and the faculty on the program there, um, it was very interesting. There was a pretty much, I would, I would say, even divide between people who were just blown away by the idea that a mother would leave the house um, without knowing exactly where her child was. And other people were like, oh yeah, you know, what's nothing to them. But one of my faculty advisors had said to me, you know, you have to change this. The mother just can't leave. She just can't walk out the door. She, you have to. And I wrote a scene and I actually wrote some, some, un, some off screen dialogue when the mother comes in and picks up Charlie to leave where she says, oh, I know where you are, or I wonder where Sophia could be. And she was like, yes, yes, that's what you need. And I put it in and then I took it out because you know, the story to my mind does not include a mother who would pay attention like that. But some people have a great deal of difficulty tolerating a mother who would actually <laughs> leave. And it's interesting to me to think who those people are, who can and cannot tolerate and what their histories might be. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think it's, a, you know, a, a black and white people with good mothers can't bear it and people with bad mothers mm -hmm. can, because I just think for some reason or other, of a mother leaving a child without knowing precisely where they are um, was really hard to bear. So that was really interesting. Um, and of course, everybody wants to know uh, how I got the performance. And um, I can only say that I had, was blessed with an incredibly talented cast, pretty much top to bottom, and that 
Sophia Massa, who plays um, Sophia in the film, um, is an extraordinarily astute and bright child who understood the general gist of the story. But also, as I said to you earlier, that um, children, especially children who want to perform, you know, their, their imaginations are so alive with such a such a thin skin between them and the actual world. You know, it's very easy for a child's imaginary life to be as real or as present as, as real life. So that for me to tell her, I never asked her to act anything because then she would act and you would see her acting. And mm -hmm. that's kind of all the bad television commercial acting you see from children, but rather just give her physical instruction, walk from here to there, walk a little more slowly, you know, stop for a second, pause, count to three, count backwards <laughs> from 10. <laughs> Counting backwards from 10 makes you look like you're having deep thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, but you're actually counting backwards from Dan. So, <laughs> you know, and, they, and, and everything that hopefully the film has led we, the audience, to think about is the thought that we project into her face, which is actually counting backwards from Dan. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's but, but you have to be a very bright and imaginative child to um, seamlessly integrate into a scenario like that. But it's such a disturbing story. But was she not affected by the story, this little girl? Well, she she was. And I mean, but from a very sort of factual, sort of pragmatic standpoint, like she that little baby is, in fact, her sister. And she said, you know, I just had to imagine what, what I would feel if something happened to Charlie. Her name is Charlie. I used their name so that it would just be easier on set. They were called something else when I first wrote the script. Yeah. Um, and she got it, you know, but there wasn't much to explain. I mean, she, she just had to th sort of think about it. Yeah. It's really yeah. interesting. Well, I, I'd be interesting to hear what other people thought about it, but it, it is so intolerable, as you've said, that a mother would let her child uh, you know, fall from her mind so that she, you know, she leaves the house without knowing where she is. But that's such a kind of concrete uh, motif for this forgotten lost child, um, Sophia. Um, and I suppose then, uh, I don't know, uh, but the implication is that she, um, she she was driving like a maniac. You know, that's the, the description earlier on that, that you know, that, that her, her, her children are secondary to something else going on in her mind. She's preoccupied in some sort of way that means that these children in uh, you know in diff these different ways are, are lost and and and, and in this um, in this tragic situation. But should we open it up to um, to the audience, Christian? See what uh, people. Yes, I think that would be great. Yeah, thank thank you again, both of you. It's and I I also thought uh, the title of the movie "Come Find Me." In a way, it's a metaphor for for what we are. In, uh, often experiencing in the consultation room because we have to find the child and where the child's mind is at. And often, uh, I think I was thinking as I was looking at the movie, it, in the counter transference, we, we might experience something similar and, and don't really, because of the child's defenses, the child might not actually show us where, where she or he is. Mm -hmm. And we might uh, mistake something that is apparent for, for something else, for, for what is actually not there. We have to find it. Mm -hmm. um, and until we find it, I think uh, the treatment is not going well and the mm -hmm. child is lost. So that, that's what I was thinking as a beginning. But I'm sure other people have um, many more thoughts about this movie. And just please uh, say what you think about it. Um, I, I would like to first disagree with those who say um, it's rare that a mother would not just leave the house without knowing where the child is. I think the metaphor is the house, but actually the mother is the house. Mm -hmm. And I think we also, the best of mothers, the good enough mother, leaves the child and is absent for a while. It's um, if it's the repeated experience 
Um, so that's what I would like to just add. I, I would because I was I was surprised that uh, so many people would say um, it doesn't happen. It happened, or maybe it's the children that we see in the office. But I also know with I'm also even in treatment I can be become absent mm -hmm. and quiet and not connected. And that's when I realized that's happening. Those are very very painful moments. So, but I suppose the the idea of of a mother who's not good enough, you know, who who who, who lets her child drop from her mind, is so abhorrent to all of us. You know, we we all have a kind of sense, do we, um, of of a mother who who can hold us in mind and who we need uh, to be held in mind by her. And uh, when we're dropped, then it, it portends catastrophe. And I'm not at all surprised, now there's description of people who said that that would never happen. It would never happen because it, it feels so as it is, if it's repeated, as you say, Ruth, if it's repeated too much, then it is, it is catastrophe. I, I want to thank you, Nella, <clears throat> sorry, for a stunning film, and Angela for really deep uh, reflections. And I was wondering about my reaction to the girl and her acting when I was watching the film, I was saying, oh, I feel terrible for her, that she has to act that part. Mm -hmm. And I think that in my counter-transference, I was joining the your audience reaction of the mothers who or the audience who is saying no it can't be that a mother would leave her child and i think it speaks to the defenses that we all join and it's so important to think about because as clinicians we are constantly fighting that defense of no this can't be happening no this is not possible and so I, I just wanted to comment that. I would offer, I mean, it's very interesting to hear those responses because on the one hand, I do think that lots of mothers leave their children in the house and there's a babysitter there and there's really nothing wrong with that. And it really is much more the insightful the, the insight that this particular mother is is disengaged before the tragedy and that that she is shown to be a disengaged mother there are certainly plenty of mothers who the babysitter comes and you leave the house and you don't know exactly i don't think that makes you a bad mother or an, an inattentive mother this mother happens to be one but talia's point that that we bring our own our own experiences and our own empathies into the situation, which hopefully, you know, is, is a wonderful sign for the filmmaker because that's exactly what one hopes for. But that um, it isn't necessarily a bad sign if a mother <laughs> if a mother leaves the house with the babysitter present, um, not knowing exactly where the child is. And so some, I think the far more interesting and telling and, and even in this conversation is one's response to seeing that, bringing into the conversation everything that each person brings in. Um, no, I, I don't mean to certainly infer that any mother who would leave their child with a babysitter not knowing exactly which room of the house they're in is, is, is neglectful in some way. And then neglect is a, an environment as Ruth points out, that already exists. And for some people to respond to it as, you know, horrified, it's all what we bring, it's all what we bring in, you know, in a sense, it's really a, a you know, any art is, 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 a, is a skeleton, you know, on display for people to fill with their own experience, which is, you know, kind of the beauty of it. So for some people to be horrified and some people to think it's blasé may mean, you know, an untold thousands of things about their own experience. 
I was also impressed by the fact that she remained hidden for so long. Um, and to me, it, it felt like it was, had sort of served dual purposes. Um, that it was both a resiliency on her part and a defensive there wasn't available and she when not found she didn't she didn't come out she didn't make herself found which most children would also do they they'd provide clues for their location um which she didn't do and then in the end the retreat again into that space had the feeling to me of this a similar both a safe space and a, a retreat. Yeah, I think that's what Angela um, described so beautifully. The basket is the casket. And it, that one could say it's very safe. Nobody is going to bother you. And, uh, and all the disappointment and unhappiness is contained and forever and you're not gonna that's what the, that's the identification with the with the death mm -hmm. thank you oh yeah also with the end first yeah, thank you as others have said for a beautiful film and a beautiful discussion that adds so much to the film but at the end you know, there's an issue about what, how to articulate or what to do with aggression, because I think, in, and also the point of view of the child. So at the very end, is she seeking not to be found again? Because um, regardless of how many times the mother sort of just left the house with or without her, that she does it once and there's a terrible catastrophe, uh, you know, is, may, may attach some magical thinking to, if she goes back again, can she either prevent the impending doom of another child or any ambivalence that she has about a replacement child. Because yeah. she may be, we don't really know how, if she's greeting it with how she feels about the replacement and is going into the basket then, you know, unconsciously what some sort of act of, as um, Gabrielle just said, you know, um, sort of protection in some way, but also is it aggression? Because what would, how would she connect the initial experience of being in the basket with the tragedy. And also, I didn't know um, if there was a babysitter in the house, um, I, you know, I th and I think there's some ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And also I had some troubled hearing at times quite what was being said. And I thought that might've been intentional um, because from the child's point of view, she hears everything probably, but doesn't necessarily understand everything. But then as you were saying, um, that so much is just not said and unable to be said, um, and especially around um, anger and um, I think despair or um, uh, uh, specifically uh, distress, none of that can be actually said or experienced even. And so I think that fills that that probably creates more opportunity for some sort of like magical and unconscious sort of fantasizing about the connections between actions and and feelings and unformed thoughts as well. And also one last thing I didn't hear at the beginning, the very beginning, the mother's phone conversation. I think I guess she was going out for a drink and driving wildly. And so I was a little bit primed to wonder, you know, is this a depiction of, you know, what happens with alcohol, but then, you know, during the film, it's really a depiction of like depression and loss and is, and, is, and as was said, you know, the Andre Green's, you know, dead mother um, and, and just the, the profound effects of the, that withdrawal and the inability to share grief or experience grief, because it's also what would be a healthy experience of a family to help the child um, be modeled grief as well as the ability to know that you can get through it. Mm 
Uh, I just wanted to say very briefly, I had seen this film before and was very affected and moved by it, and then seeing it again today and listening to your explication of the text, Angela, I thought was extraordinary. It was like every frame had meaning, and it just was made me so appreciative of both the filmmaker um, and you for doing that. Um, it just made it come become exponentially more poignant and powerful. Thank you. I think that's a good point because I also, I saw when, she, when the mother is asleep, at one point she moves a little bit, you, you see she's barefoot. But then on her night table are the shoes of the dead mm. guy. And so it's, so all of these things are. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I, first of all, I, I, I didn't, I want to, I just, I want to thank Angela for her extraordinarily insightful and sensitive and, um, I mean, a million words come to mind, but I mean, to have spent so much time thinking so carefully about the film and, and to have brought it so clearly and, and um, insightfully forward, I'm, I'm very grateful indeed. Um, I think I'm very lucky to have such a careful and astute reading of it um, and to share that with this group who are making such interesting and intelligent comments on it. Um, it's very exciting to be able to watch it repeatedly this way through your eyes. Um, I will I will say um, the sound <laughs> in 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 the zoom technology does mm -hmm. not come through terribly well. So mm -hmm. certain comments about where the sound and, and where the sound sits is terribly important, right? When you're when you're constructing something like this, how far away it is, whether it sounds like it's coming from another room, all of those subtleties are kind of flattened through the Zoom because the Zoom has technology of its own to make it feel like you're in the room with someone. So a movie through Zoom becomes a whole different soundscape than what's intended. So you might enjoy going back and listening to the film at some future moment. Um, to hear where the sound is placed. It, it does sort of uh, adjust the telling of the story to a certain degree. Um, for example, David's point, um, Sophia in the box, you can hear the mother greet the babysitter, but as though in another room. So you're getting, so it's very important to stay with Sophia because the film is her point of view, but you do get the information that the mother's greeting a babysitter, um, hopefully. Um, and that doesn't really come through technologically in this particular context. What I found so striking was that I found myself thinking this is a wonderful film because it could be about several different things. And it reminded me of a patient I am sitting seeing at the moment, who uh, a year ago, or perhaps a bit more, had her first child. And um, the thing that's happened now is mother is pregnant for the second time. And as a result of lockdown, we meet on Zoom. And uh, which means that the child is sometimes with us or sometimes not, depending on the vicissitudes of the child care arrangements. But what is absolutely clear to me about this child is that, and I'm not talking about the child in the film, I'm talking about the first child of my patient is that he is very aware of, first of all, my existence in his world, and B, the fact that his mother is pregnant um, because her womb is swelling. And uh, I think he really doesn't like it if mother is distracted away from him by mother's sessions with me. 
So here we have a child maybe um, who we are seeing going through the processes of displacement by the second child. It's one way of looking at it. But um, the application to the film is the mother says to Sophie, how would you like to be a mother when you grow up? Yeah. Would you like it? Yes. And um, we'll, we're going to have a second child. How do you feel about that? Now, I found that didn't quite fit in the text of the film. And I start, because this was a film for a master's filmmaking course, as I understand it, I was wondering whether there was some influence of various film school theories about how you think about time and the sequence of various events. Now, I wonder if the maker could comment on that, but I felt it was wonderful because I felt that like uh, the little boy who is the child of my patient, suddenly getting the feeling that there's going to be a third party around and it's not going to be dad. And uh, so we have a whole new application of the film. It could be one way of looking at it is the loss of an actual child, or it could be the loss of a relationship with a mother, or it could be the loss of the old family with the arrival of a new one. So we have a whole kaleidoscope of different themes. Now, I don't know whether you made the film with various issues that you wanted to play with, like time, like events, like attachments, and uh, fear. And I felt, yes, the interesting thing is that when the younger child disappeared, then she got, Sophie got back in the laundry basket and uh, there was the little rabbit who seemed to signify in that moment the missing child or what kind of signification was this? Was it, for example, her wish? Oh, let's get rid of that little whippersnapper. Mm -hmm. Well, just get her out of here. <laughs> I don't know, but um, I think the film is so rich that um, I wanted to share it all with you because uh, I found it very stimulating. And I saw it first about a week ago. And <coughs> as a result, I've been thinking about it off and on since, particularly in the light of my patient with a new babe arriving and announcing it to her one year old. So there we go. Thank you. Shall, shall I respond? <laughs> um, Please. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that you that you felt so engaged with it, um, and it's just so wonderful how all the 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 many places and thoughts and associations that it led you to. Um, I mean, specifically in answer to the, the theoretical question, um, I'm not really good about retaining those sorts of 
um, structural ideas when I write. I just kind of write, um, or rather, I just write. Um, and given that what I focused on really was this, this child's experience, what would this child's experience be under the, in this um, series of events? Um, and I trust myself as a storyteller, because I have been doing that for a very long time, um, that those things will pull themselves together appropriately to tell a story that I want to tell. If I allow my imagination to ruminate and and cough stuff up, um, so and and I am very admiring of other people who are able to kind of bring those theoretical concepts into their creative into their creative process as they go or that as they have them as a goal. But personally, I don't have that experience. Um, it works out nicely though, and you'll I'll write something and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that refers to that and that brings through this idea. And as I go along, if I'm lucky, that'll happen. Um, and as I've gotten older and the more I do it, the more it does happen because that is kind of the skill that one hopes to develop as one goes. Um, and then if they bear out a theory um, that speaks in some way to the veracity of the theory. I suppose in storytelling, and if you, as you're describing, you, know, you, you let your imagination, you give it rain, um, that there's going to be inevitably, it's not necessarily a theoretical, a set of theoretical propositions that get um, elaborated, but actually it, um, the elements of one's imaginative process actually are dense with potential meaning. And these, these will come no matter what, they'll be there. And, and so indeed, as Jim says, the you know, the motif of the dead sister is replete with all kinds of potential. I mean, I didn't go into that, but one of the things I certainly thought of was, yeah, get rid of her. You know, she's an intruder. I want, I want mummy to myself. And even the, you know, the twin, the reference to the twin sandwich, as I was looking at it again, I thought, oh, I hadn't thought about that first time because it, it's the, the mother's sandwich and her sandwich are the same. And I, when I first saw it, or when I was thinking about it, just thought about it, you know, the, the way in which her sandwich is cut into two, but actually maybe that's an expression of wanting mummy to herself. She and mummy are twinned together without any interloper. So, so um, I, I think filmmakers don't need psychoanalytic theory. I think they need a, a, good, a good relationship with their imagination and we psychoanalysts could get them bring our theory to bear on, on what you've produced. It's, it's so interesting too, because um... The, the little stuffed animal, and I have this very intense relationship because when I was writing the film, one thing I started to write, which I eventually totally took out, was that that little stuffed animal <laughs> would be all over the place, like riding in the car, and that it would be like this magical realism thing where over her shoulder, it would just be sitting on the, realistically on the ledge of the car seat, or, you know, only in her mind and only then symbolically and only then magical realistically if that were the style of the film but then i reminded myself that in fact that is not the style of the film and maybe i would make a film someday with some magical realism elements to it and then that little stuffed animal could make fabulous appearances in all these other places but it wasn't really appropriate for this film this film has a a, 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 a efficiency to it that it would have <clears throat> mucked up so i didn't i didn't put it there and in fact, in the last shot, when she gets back in the box, originally the way that I had shot it, the way, originally the way that I shot it was um, that she's kind of holding the baby, the little stuffed animal um, at the very end in the last shot. And it just bothered me to see it because it seemed very inessential. Um, it, it wasn't the point little toy and the, you know the symbolism did its job earlier when she opens it up and there it is on its face and everything but then it really was about penetrating um her sense of loneliness and her sense of well now what happens to me kind of which is where we leave her at the end of the film um nothing should happen to me or which is so marvelously pointed out by your reference to the 
this whole body of literature that I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Nela, what you just said made me um, aware that was that pick like her lunchbox, which was pink. And while it, I thought that was such a, an amazing object um, in the movie. And I was thinking who, that was almost the only child girly like thing that was there. And it was, it's about food. And I thought, who gave that box to the child? And I'm sure you must have had thoughts about because there are many uh, boxes you could have given. But this was such, to me, a, a metaphor of like, to myself, there is hope. <laughs> and she held while she waited. And I thought there is something that she can hold on to. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that's lovely. I am, um, I mean, that's lovely. And I love, I, I love, I love that you see it in that way. I mean, I certainly thought when I bought the lunchbox, you know, she should have a fabulous lunchbox. And, you know, <laughs> if I was her mother, what lunchbox would I buy her? And, you know, let's go on Amazon and pick a really great lunchbox. And like, cause she doesn't get, to, as you say, but she doesn't get to have much, right. And certainly of what we see, we actually never go in her room. She, and we don't even see the door though. Anyway, that's, I had decorated her door, but it, the shot, we didn't use it. Um, but yes, I mean, yes, there's a lot. I mean, obviously, and, and Joanne Huang, who was the production designer, although she and I really, I did all the props, but um, a lot of thought goes into all of that, obviously, in every film. Um, and, what, and what stories the props tell you and what stories the clothes tell you. Um, I mean, I had, and I, I had set her clothes to, to go from very vivid colors to be very, um, monochrom not monochromatic, but mono monotonal. So that by the end of the film, she's wearing pale green and she's wearing pale this and she's wearing pale that. At the beginning of the film, <clears throat> she's wearing very rich colors that are very powerful and strong and sort of the, the intensity of it is drained out. And, and I don't think people tend to notice that, but it does create a feeling that you hopefully don't register uh, intellectually, but that you register emotionally. Mm -hmm. That's the fun. comment about the other adults in the film. Um, the, the thought of being held by mom or anyone, um, even the babysitter, it, it's quite remarkable to think that the babysitter was there for what seems like at least a few hours because the sun set and even the babysitter didn't think to check on the child. And we think about the micro moments of the child waking up, realizing the sunset, acknowledging that mom remembered to take her sister, but didn't bother to look for her. And those, the, the complicated feelings that get aroused that mom got to take my baby sister and wanted to, but didn't even look for me. And then to see the babysitter who didn't even look for her. And that as Ruth, Angela, you pointed out earlier, the babysitter is the only person that tried to bring words and tried to communicate. And the babysitter is an outsider, an outsider of the family. And so outside of the family, she has a different color skin. I mean, how much more outside can you get? Um, I think that's really intriguing um, to think about how a young child would process that. And then there's also the relationship with the father who the scene in the grocery store is sweet. And then there's hope that maybe he will be able to support her. Um, but twice when the young lady is stranded outside and when the mother is upset and leaves the the tea party, the father goes straight to supporting mom and sort of jumps over trying to offer any support to the, the child. So we see many repeated interactions by many different adults where she's just not in their mind, which I think is also important. Yeah, I, I too started to think about others in the uh, in the family or in the environment. 
Um, and um, before I make my comment, let me also thank, uh, thank you both for the film and the commentary. It's been wonderful, but um, the film uh, does uh, foreground uh, the, the child, Sophia, not being found. But it seems to me in the background, Sophia of a sorts finds her mother. You know, there's the scene um, at the end of giving the sweets. There's the scene um, when mother is sleeping and the child sees it, but doesn't seem to knock on the, the, um, of the glass to awake her, perhaps letting her sleep. There's the uh, moment when the child is looking at the photos kind of mourning in a way when the rest of the family is seeking this magical solution. So there, there's something about, um, and yet another was when the mother was angry and the girl was just standing there. She, she kind of confined the mother um, in a containing way, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a reversal. Um, it's a reversal, of course, typical development. And, um, and I started to wonder what gave her that capacity, perhaps. Um, is it other people in the family? Is there a grandmother that we don't know about? Is the babysitter much more present than we seem to know? Um, so um, that's another side of it that was coming to my mind. See, I wouldn't see that as a capacity. I would see, as I tried to explore, I would see that as part of a, you know, a defensive movement, really, to care for mother, um, a reversal, as you say, um, and, and which leaves her stranded, really, in terms of her own experience. Which brings to mind also the word, I think, Gabrielle, you used it, uh, resilience. And how I, mean, I think there is this idea in the general culture about child being, children being resilient and um, in a kind of a distorted way, in a kind of a overly tough, independent way. And I, I loved in the film how the blurriness between is this the child, and I think you tapped on it so well, Angela, you know, is this the child's capacity to, um, to put herself together to, you know, what we would say resilience from a true ego strength, or is this the child fragility that we see unfolding and we are so terribly worried for her because what will she do with that? So I thought that was so important and for us also to think about. I, I kind of have a lot of feelings about the use of the idea of resilience and how it is being used to tell to send children certain messages. Tough egg, her mother describes her as. Yes. I I was thinking the same. Well, but but there is a it's both. To me, it seemed like there was both. It was her fragility and this terrible loss that she would she would be a survivor of her mother, of her father, of her of this death. And in some ways, there was a way because of the um, pseudo maturity of being the, the parental figure that she was able to hold the mother in mind, to even sit in the front door knowing mother was there inside. And at some point, someone would let her in. There is a way in which she held the thread uh, what what that resiliency is would be remains to be seen, but there was a there was some hope. To me, there felt that there was some hope for the for the mind of this child. Well, well, let me bring in Andre Green again because it's very interesting his discussion of the the fate of the of the child who has a dead mother, and you know he he writes about um, 
the terror the child has of the mother coming alive again, because what that portends is a repetition of the loss and the tragedy of that. And so he writes about the, um, the, the child, I, want to, I can't remember quite the words he uses, but taking up um, residence at the tomb of the dead mother, you know, and, and we might think about that scene of her sitting at the door, waiting, endlessly patient, and okay, someone's going to come and daddy comes home, but actually her mother is dead inside and she's there to, um, to mark it. And the inside, I suppose, her sense of her own dead mother inside her. It's interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad some people saw some hope in it because I found myself getting more and more and more hopeless and despairing the more I thought about uh, you know, each of the elements of the, of the film. And so now that, yeah, I mean, unrelenting and, and unremitting and dark and, you know, gosh, you know, um, and I suppose calling out uh, uh, maybe our defences against that, because it, uh, it's unthinkable that a child should be so left so alone you know, in such despair. It's interesting too the conversations that I had around this issue of the mother leaving the house. And I, uh, I did end up like, I decided to survey <laughs> as many people who had seen the film as I was working on it. And maybe that speaks to the, as Gabrielle said, that it's both, it's resilience and damage or resilience and, um, you know, injury that, mm -hmm. that there are people who certainly, I mean, I'm sure it's, and I'm sure you all can tell me, it's extremely common that children grow up with this kind of environment and that many times, you know, they get through and they grow up and they, they somehow find their way out um, to one degree or another. And uh, certainly everyone I spoke to who didn't think the mother was, you know, so particularly awful was like, struck me, frankly, when I think on it, um, as sort of tough kind of survivor -y kind of good, with good senses of humor, ha! who had that response, Thank interestingly. You. Dark humor, maybe. Yes, mm. perhaps instilled from this kind of an experience. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, to me, I, I, I also thought of the, um, like some of the characters in, in literature that I grew up with, you know, the little princess and the secret garden girls who had to hide in baskets, um, metaphorically, but mm -hmm. found their, their way out. But to go back to what Christian's first uh, remarks, uh, you know, when we meet, this sort of child or an adult with this kind of experience in the consulting room you know what 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 is um how 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 do these people find their way out and you know, what what are the conditions which will enable a child to be open to being found or an adult open to being found and and not um in the you know the green uh, uh, account you know make sure that that dead mother is not going to come alive again because it's so terrible to think about experiencing that uh, that loss you made me think of another situation maybe i'm sure others have experienced that too you see a child and it's who is being brought by someone and then the person who brings the child disappears and at the end of the session, you bring this child to the waiting room. And there's no one there, but you have to see already the next patient. Then what do you do? And if it, it's a small child, who okay. can? It's 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 uh, it's an awkward situation. Then you have two, and what, you have to call and see what's going on. But the other child is already there, and this one is you're not sure what to tell the child where the person is. And, it's, so we, I think we, we, we experience this in the counter transference of, often when you say, well, what do we do? How do you deal with it? What, how do we help these children? Mm. 
I suppose just thinking about the complexity of it, there's, it, it's inevitable, isn't it, in the transference that we will be found to be the mother, uh, you know, the dead mother will be found to be the one who abandons, who leaves, who can't speak, who, who, um, who turns away, uh, who is preoccupied. Um, and at the same time, or um, as the work evolves, uh, being a being available to be found as well. I mean, that's part of the complexity, isn't it, of 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 work in this territory. You know, to to bear to be the repetition of of the of the dead mother, um, and how how we might actually be so viscerally turned away from that, absolutely not want to be experienced in 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 that way, and yet having to be open to 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 be being experienced in that way. Mm. Certainly I hear in um, clinical discussions sometimes um, a kind of, um, should I put it, uh, annoyance with the patient that they can't see that the analyst is offering them so, you know, such good stuff, you know, um, that, uh, and that somehow the patient gets turned into, you know, an ungrateful or not recognising of, of, um, of what's being offered uh, in a generous you know, way. And certainly I, I, I find um, uh, supervising students and candidates, I, I find it's, it, it's, um, it's such a difficult uh, challenge clinically to us to be, uh, allow ourselves to be experienced as the, the failing object, the, the object who was, who, who was so central to producing the, the pathology that arrives in our rooms. Well, yes, but in a way it's inevitable because there is such a thing as the end of a session. <laughs> um, and and there's the beginning of a ne next session, hopefully. Um, and I was thinking about your thought, but what do you do when the person who's supposed to be in the waiting room waiting for your patient isn't there? Um, well, it could be that they've gone off to the, have a pee um, and they will be coming back. But if it really happens over and over again, um, I, I think I would think, well, what's going on in this family that they just don't seem to be able to create a, a babysitter or a carer that sticks around. Um, so it, it varies from patient to patient, uh, just like this wonderful film. I think we've all seen it in our own particular ways and scares the living daylights out of all of us in some respect. But um, I was wondering about the sweets in the film, whether they represented something about goodies. But at the same time, I thought, well, no worries about tooth decay there. <laughs> um, so <laughs> how did they get in quite? Anyway, you don't have to say. But, um, I think mm. it's like an analysis isn't just this is difficulty I, I have with here and now technique. And I'm not sure whether you're afflicted with that in the US. But uh, a session is never a one off. It's always compressed into all the sessions which have gone on. And all the sessions that are to come. You can't avoid it. So sometimes we're going to be awful. So Ruth, you were going to talk. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say um, about this patient who is not being picked up. Um, I think there, there, if we as analysts are not hopeful, then who can be? And I think the repetition of what are we doing with a patient who is not being picked up actually this also is a chance of working through 
and and experiences the, this awful experience with the patient that uh, and then and and working through this experience and i've been just thinking and i don't know why it came up almost at the end um I'm seeing a little girl whose mother died when she was five. The parents have been divorced, very poor family in the Bronx. And they had not, they have been divorced. And the father were, made sure that he, I knew that this mother was a not good enough mother from the start. She died very suddenly. The girl I've been seeing now for two years, three times a week, has not been able to talk about the mother until this Mother's Day. And it, I just want to point out like the repetition, which we all know, having now been with this child over more than two years, she went this Mother's Day to the mother's grave with the father, and they both cried. Mm -hmm. So one can refine something. One can rediscover. And I think if we are not hopeful, who can be? I mean, absolutely, yes, absolutely. I have to admit, I cried too. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, I think that in addition to the limitations on time, like you just said, the session ends, there's such a limitation in the physicality that is allowed you know, clinically or that would be appropriate or even therapeutic. And so uh, might cry or be expressive. Um, and even the idea about who is picking up the child, you know, which is to, to get the child, but also what, how do we pick up the child sort of verbally and emotionally? Because this film evokes such a yearning and a desire and a constriction of touching I think that it was pointed out, you know, the mother wipes away the, the smudge, which is, you know, cleaning up the mess, which is appropriate, but also is she cleaning up some other mess too and wiping it away? And she's in the parent's bed, you know, but then everyone is so segregated and there's no actual, you just wish someone could hug Sophia, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it just doesn't happen, even where they're together in the car or they're together outside the house, which I think Ruth brought up as a metaphor. They're outside on the terrace, you know, looking over everything and um, yet they're together, but the house can't contain them. And they're not really, they interact sometimes through, through that setting the table, but they're not really kind of to, actually together. And I wonder if it's a conscious choice, you know, obviously to contain the you know, extreme isolation is, you know, one thing to be alone, like she's sitting on the porch or outside and she knows, Sophia knows she's alone, but maybe she knows mom is in the house. It's different to be alone with other people, you know, and I'm not sure what Winnicott says about that and, and, and Green, you know, maybe you could comment on that, but it is so profoundly distressing. Like, I didn't even know, like, I wonder, is the father, you know, are they divorced? Is the you know, it, early on in the short film, like, where is the dad, you know? Um, and what does his presence or absence mean? And then, you know, he does, he's not too physical, although he does, there is a physicality implied through giving her, she says, can I have the sweets? And I think he said to sweeten, you know, eventually to sweeten up the mother, you know, that's an unconscious or desire there. But the dad allows her to have those and then obviously, you know, their, their parents are physical, they're having another baby, but it's such a shock because they're so, you know, not there. And um, I wondered too about the shot of the stairs. Um, I, it was, it was um, I thought there was more meaning there than I had time to appreciate, um, you know, and something is up or down and, there's a bareness and starkness and loneliness to the stairs too, but I just, that, that, that's separate from all that, but it, um, again, it's loneliness, but. I mean, Winnicott writes about, you know, in his uh, paper on the capacity to be alone, about being alone in the presence of another. And uh, according to his point of view, you know, this comes out of, uh, 
being with mother, but being able to be inside oneself with mother. Um, and it's, I think what he's getting at is that mother can tolerate the child's uh, interiority uh, and doesn't have to be always pushing herself into it or requiring something from the child, but that there's a coexistence um, that can, uh, can, can evolve. Um, which I, th I think leads to a, um, a capacity for solitude as opposed to loneliness. Because in a state of solitude, you can be with yourself in the presence of, you know, the in the presence of psychically. So you're, you're not um, atomized, you're not, uh, you're not shut out. Well, you know, I, I thought that the, when the child goes back to the basket, I felt hope. I thought this child is going to get herself uh, situated so that someone will pay attention to her. Uh, and I, I think that was a positive shot for me, positive photographic shot. Mm -hmm. But I, I could see that it could be either way. Uh, but I did get the feeling that this little girl is traumatized, but she's going to be her own helper. And she's going to work hard to be able to be alone because she has to be alone in this family. The family leaves her alone. And so I, I was hopeful. Because the first time I saw the movie, I was very uh, saddened by the whole story. And this time it's still sad, but I felt that there's action and there's something that's going to happen positively for the kid. So maybe that's just my... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, listening to you makes me think of Moses with the basket. Mm, that yeah. was hope in a way, bad beginning, but there was some hope. Yes, I thought there was hope. Yeah. So. I can't hear you, Kathy. You're, you're, uh... Uh, you. I, I was thinking the same thing um, because um, I guess based on what everybody was saying and especially Angela, when you said that it's a joy to be hidden, that maybe this was a second chance to um, enjoy it and have a positive outcome. Uh, it's up in the air, but I, I did think that. Yeah, she's the, the girl seems so grown up uh, in the way she's thinking. She, she'll sit outside. She knows mom is inside, but she knows mom is still there. She'll sit there for the time and, uh, and that won't disturb her. And she'll also climb back into the into the uh, basket. Uh, so I, I felt like she's becoming more able to uh, fight for herself, I think. That's what I felt from the movie, which I wanna thank Nella for. It's a beautiful movie. I don't think I can watch it a third time because I think I would dissolve into tears. <laughs> A question for Nella. Thank you for everyone. This has been a wonderful experience, the movie and uh, such a great explanation and thought provoking um, discussion about it. A question about how and why you chose that particular candy, because I I'm struck on the mom saying you're a tough egg. And the, and the candy is an egg. It's, it, it has a shell, a candy shell, and there's chocolate in the inside and thinking about how the daughter is trying to become that egg, this hard shell on the outside and giving herself to her mom in the only way she can, trying to be as sweet and quiet and out of the way and giving her mom, not only the literal sweetness and the candy, but doing her best job to have nothing but sweetness inside. Um, and being that caretaker for mom? Um, I, I, lo I love that you see that in there. I, I would say primarily that candy was, I chose it because it's colorful and because it's individual and because she could hold it 
and because she could also, we all know that that candy, when it gets hot, uh, smudges. <laughs> and so you, you know, it's such a, a I, I felt it's such an experience of, of young childhood, like holding, I think I remember holding M&Ms in my own hand, you know, in the hot and you're out in the sun and they, they, they do that and then they do this. And then, and that was, that's why I chose them also pragmatically because they can exist outside of their wrapper, which I do not have the right to photograph. So it had to be something that I could, um, I could in fact put in a clear container, which was also visually useful because then you could see all the way along that it was a box of color, that it was a box of light, that it was a box of life, you know, sort of from the beginning of the film to the end of mm -hmm. its purpose, you know, and it, in a sense, it does take on a symbolic value, not only the one that you saw, but also color and, um, well, color, really, color and excitement and pleasure mm -hmm. through, you know, and I'll give that to, to, you know, she gives it to her mother to try to give her that thing. And also to give her the thing that she loves, because if she gives her the thing that she loves, you know, I guess, theoretically, one, one could posit then the mother will give it back. But, but pragmatically speaking, this ought to, if this doesn't fix her, I don't know what will, I think is the thought I was having. Because <laughs> if you're five, then what else would fix you except m and I mean, that everyone knows. I think one of the um, uh, great values of this film is how many different interpretations are possible that we can all <laughs> provide something and get something out of it. Yeah, it's very gratifying to hear the fertility of it all, if you will. Well, in listening to this, I keep thinking that it's true, the multiplicity of, of ideas and feelings and fantasies that it evokes in us. I just keep thinking this is why we became child analysts, yeah. you know, to figure out all kinds of experiences, um, you know, in life, in our own childhoods, whatever, that, um, as Ruth said, we want to find hope, right? Mm -hmm. It's so appealing. So thank you both. Thank you, Nella. Thank you, Angela. Everybody, it's been really a particularly fine discussion. Thank you for having me. Well, as we were saying, I think the film lends itself to it. You know, it's a gift for us to uh, yeah. to be able to contemplate it. It looks like we could talk about it much for much longer. <laughs> Just because of that. But maybe we have to, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add something about hope and or not hope and thinking about who that girl is and who mother is. And I, now that we talk so much about her, I almost see like, was mother a child like her? Is this if no intervention would be done? Mother is looking, so she's also lonely. Mother's very lonely, but somehow managed to find a partner, manages to have sex, manages to want another child. But there's this deep, profound loneliness that we see in the child. Actually, we can also see in the mother. So, and so it it damp it damps it gives a damp on my hope being hopeful. Mm -hmm. Well, in this, we, we also know, don't we, how um, these things are passed down the generations. Right, exactly. Yeah, and my comment about this not being a child-friendly house, you know, it's beautiful and it's all so well-ordered, etc. Um, perhaps what you're saying, Ruth, now, that is the, the way in which uh, Nella expresses the, the, um, the, the lack of space in this mother to uh, to have a to, to have a child in that kind of messy way that kind of creative way she has a child but it's it's a child who's a kind of magical solution rather than a child uh, who can you know who, who can live in a psychic way and is this resilience and if this is resilience i don't want it <laughs> yeah 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 
I, I don't know if any of you have read this novel by Penelope Lively called Passing On. It's about three adult children contending with the death of their extremely difficult mother and how they come to a resolution uh, even though each of them has suffered in different ways at her hand. Mm. A recommendation. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to thank all of you, uh, thank Nella and thank Angela, but really also all of you for, for thinking about it. And as I mentioned, we could talk about it much more. I think we are doing in our consultation room. We are, that's, we, that's what we're doing. So, <laughs> well, it has been very helpful. Thanks. Well, thank you. I think it's been an enjoyable afternoon even if i am left feeling very sad again i mean I, I i don't share the hope i think that's been expressed although i do um see absolutely we we couldn't be analysts without hope could we i mean we, we do our work with with hope um it would be impossible otherwise thank you thank you thank you we found each other so that's one good thing yeah, yeah. okay Okay, so. Okay. So thank you. Yes, bye, bye bye. Thank, thank you, you very much, Christian. Okay.